It's that time of week where we chat with our guy, Michael Tuop, Alana Choir basketball analyst, former Illinois and Wright State basketball player. Mike, since the last time we talked, very, very different performances by Illinois, both at home, two reeling teams in the Big Ten, one playing really well now in Indiana uh, that just, we use the term, John Gross used the term, punked Illinois uh, at their home um, arena, obviously. And then Illinois really bounces back with a strong, tough performance against a younger Ohio State team uh, where the defense dominated. So what stood out, if, if you look at those two games in whole, um, what stood out about this past week of Illinois basketball? Yeah, I'll start with the most fresh one, the Ohio State game. Phenomenal execution, particularly on the on the defensive end. And that's what it starts with. You, you can't let this Ohio State team punk you because that's what they do with their size and physicality. They live in the paint. They get downhill. They just as suing will – pivot to death and likely pivots to death and tries to get you to bite. And then finally they're able to score. And in their five high major wins this year, they've shot over 48% from two and all of them. I think two of them, they were 48%. The other ones, they were way above 50 and you hold them to 36%. And in large part, that's because of your contesting and contesting without following up, stick around for the film. And it's uh, Coleman Hawkins contesting masterclass. Mm -hmm. uh he was just phenomenal and and i'll get in we'll get into to him but i think being able to force those low percentage high degree of difficulty floaters pull-ups that's what this defense is built on because they have the length to contest and to make those shots a little bit more difficult than you know as much as we we love trent and plumber and, and these guys when you're a little bit smaller like that those those shots are a little bit easier now trent did everything he could to make those difficult but for these guys, it's a little bit easier to contest and and make those shots tough. So the Indiana game was different. I think, obviously, when you come into a game like that, and just my read on it was, and I may have thought the same way on this, where, hey, I think we're good with Dane. I think he's a good enough defensive player to where maybe Zach Eady is the one where you're like, we need to offer help. But everyone else in this league, we think he can handle one-on-one. -on -one, and that just wasn't the case. And all that stuff through – finding out who you have on this team and matchups, that's all going to be trial and error. You hate that it ended in a loss. You want to learn from a win, but I think it's, it's good that it happened because now you can at least honestly assess and be like, all right, the Dickinson's of the world, the Edie's even Amori to a degree, you can say, Hey, we have some film and we can deploy a different strategy. And you'd rather that be the case then March 5th with potentially the conference hanging in the ballots being like, let's see what happens. Yeah. Like at least, you know, now. So I think that was the biggest difference defensively. I mean, offensively, I thought Indiana knocked them off their spots. It was very reminiscent of the Northwestern game where they were initiating their offense and how they were initiating it. But quite frankly, it all, to me, it came down to trace Jackson Davis because not only were his 35 points important, the way he and Jordan Geronimo play in tandem really eliminated any chance to help because Ger Geronimo was so good in that rover spot, dunker spot, short corner to where he knows that's his outlet. It's not always the guys because you're hyper-focused on Miller Cop and all these guys on the perimeter. Geronimo was, was perfect. Hey, if you want to offer any help from a big rotating under, I'm just going to make you pay and Jackson Davis knew where to go. So I know that's a lot. I know that's kind of unpacking two games, but yeah. that was the biggest difference to me. Well, this Ohio State game, I mean, the score wasn't even – it was a little closer in the game actually was here in, in the second half, but Mike, what did they do to sense the ball and, and to key? Uh, th those are the, the two guys that I think you really got to slow down for this Ohio state team. Justice suing is a really good piece off the bench and they limited him uh, in the first half as well. But what did they do so well defensively, especially against those stars? And, and I guess I should mention McNeil uh, who got going a little early and then was a non-factor the rest of the game. Yeah. I think you played into, what Ohio State's struggling with, and that's trying to figure out who they are. And right now, it's just they're a team that, hey, Bryce Sensabaugh, if you give, if you let him take the reins, he's going to take the reins. And he's a tremendous player. He's a lottery pick. I think he'll end up being in that range. He'll probably be in the 10 to 14 range for, for the NBA draft. So all you want to do is just make life difficult on him. He's going to make some shots. But even when I show on the film, some of the ones he made, some of the floaters, the contest, I mean, those were not easy shots. And when you don't allow easy shots, then eventually water finds its level and you have whatever he was at at one point, three for 10 
from the field. I know I think he went two for three. He made two of his last three late, just kind of, you know, game was decided at that point, but you made it extremely difficult on him to get any type of rhythm. And that's what these Ohio state players, these guys that are talented, they have a ton of talent. That's what they, you know, feast on is like, okay, we're in a rhythm. We're getting downhill. We're getting easy shots around the rim. You didn't allow that. And even when they went in, you clapped your hands and said, great, that was, those weren't easy ones. So and it was Zed Key as well. And Dane Danger is going to learn. Uh, there were little things that we can touch on with Dane that I think he can improve on um, to keep himself out of foul trouble in particular. But um, Sean McNeil, I think, is a guy that he had seven points. He had two field goals to start the game. And then he makes two free throws with like five minutes left. And it was those were the only points that he had. And you completely eliminated him through your effort. Jay Neps, RJ Melendez, just refusing to get screened. They run a ton of actions for Sean McNeil. A ton of and and when you refuse to get screened because he's such a good shooter because he can score it when you get hit on a screen that puts the rest of your defense in scramble mode because you're oh my god it's Sean McNeil and then these other guys feast off of that so if you keep your house in order if you contest if you play the game in the middle of the floor and say hey we're just going to keep you here and if you want to shoot this floater great we'll contest we'll get the rebound that's what they did. And it's, I'll go back. It was phenomenal execution and they did it to a T and it, it's what won them this game. Yeah, Mike, uh, I know defense is a key to consistency and success for most teams, for most coaches, but I was just looking this up before you and I got on here and it, it's pretty jarring when you look at just the Ken Palm game plan here it shows you the defensive efficiency uh, for Illinois throughout the season. All the red Illinois defensive rating is over 102. They are 0 and 6 in games in which their defensive rating is over 102, which is basically more than a point per possession, right? They are 14 and 0 when they're under a defensive rating of 102. It seems pretty clear that when this team guards and defends, they win. And, and they're right now un, unbeatable when they defend to their capability, most likely. Yeah. And it all, we've talked about before how much it ties in, how when you're defending, when you're doing what you're supposed to do defensively, how that sets you up offensively and how that brings it back to the defense after your offense. So we mentioned it and we talked about it, I think, on the last podcast where we talk about these runs. It's like, oh, 7-0 run, 10-0 run, and we always think about offense. It's defense because everybody goes at, everybody has offensive droughts. This is another thing I mentioned. I apologize for rehashing some things, but – we get so hyper-focused on the team that we cover or as fans, the teams that we watch. And like these five-minute, six-minute droughts, everyone has them. Yeah. Ohio State had one last night. Illinois had one last night. Every single game, your defense is what either makes it a run or doesn't make it a run. I think I made the joke last week where it's like, no one talks about, man, they're on a 10-8 run. It's the, the only thing that makes it a run is your defense. So, yes, there's, there's no surprise looking at this, especially with a new team – Man, when you're guarding, you're winning games. And that is something I think they can look at and really say, man, when we – shots – I mean, they were, what, five for 28 last night from three? Just uh, look how I stack it there if, if people are watching on YouTube. Yeah. Their six worst defensive performances they've lost. The 14 best ones they've won. Like, yeah, and granted, you, you have some non-conference sprinkled in sure. there. Yeah. But at the same time – But they're eight and six. Uh, yes. Against high majors, their eight wins are their best defensive performances. Absolutely. So that that's that's what you want to see, and that's something you can continue to bring every single game. When your shooting will have its peaks and valleys, and guys are in slumps, RJ Melendez is having trouble shooting it. Um, you, know, you can go down the list. That's at least what you know you have. And when it's good, it's really good because they have the skill, they have the length to be able to do it. So um, that's great work right there. Because that's, I think that's a, that's very emblematic of what this team is, and if they want to win and continue to win, not only in conference play, but as we get to March, that's that's going to have to be what they rely on. That's going to have to be their pillar. And just to to bring up your point, like the offense is tied to the defense. You take bad shots, poor shot selection, you turn it over. You tend to not play defense as well. Like there's there's a couple performances offensively where they won despite not having a good offensive game, but six of their worst eight offensive performances, right? They, they, they lose. So uh, it is all tied together, but I just thought it was interesting looking at that. 
Uh, per- phenomenal performance against Ohio State by, by Coleman Hawkins. 11 points, nine rebounds, six assists, just one turnover, three blocks. And I think you mentioned, you tweeted out last night, he had several more shots that he influenced. Uh, c- kind of the Kofi thing, uh, where he influences more shots than even blocks. He is up and down. He's really up and down. And that and that's the next step of becoming a star, right? And really probably the next step for him to solidify his NBA draft stock, right, Mike? Yeah, and, and look, we've been on this roller coaster with with Coleman for the year. And and granted, he's being ushered into a new type of role and they're moving him around in different spots. But I have somewhat of a working theory on what makes him good game in and game out. Let me hear and it. when he's at the five, he's way more engaged. Hmm. And why he's way more engaged is because when you are at the five and you're guarding a Zed key, Felix Akpara, you're in drop coverage and you are the air traffic control of the defense. You see everything, you're planning the lane, you're pointing, you're talking. And that's the point right there, the communication. When he is the guy that is standing in the paint, you know, he sees everything. And so he has to talk. And when you talk, you get out of your own head. That's and that's when he's at his best is when he's out of his own head, when he's pouring in the other guys, when he's talking, you come here, you go here. He's even calling. So I think in the second half, he called an offensive play. He was I think he was chop, I think is what he was doing or, or stack, whatever it was. And they ended up getting a good look out of it. But he gets rewarded because Ty Rogers gets the rebound and kicks it to him for the dunk. And look, I think for him, the predictability, I've mentioned it before, the, predict- the predictability offensively has really helped him cut down on turnovers because he knows for the most part where he's going to be and who he's going to pass to, where certain guys are on the floor. Uh, one turnover last night, that's what you want to see from him because he still has the ball in his hands a lot. And then the other thing too is when he was at the five, they picked on Ohio State because they just went to that chin action and the chin action is really a three-man game in the middle of the floor where you can start it however you want. And then you have back screens come, you know, back screen up on Hawkins. Hawkins sets a back screen after he, and you just, you pick on guys because guys are worried about him shooting. So it, it opens up Jay Neps to get a wide open point blank layup off that back screen. And you can move around. You can still play out a spread, but the chin action, the different actions you can have with him at the five, I think expands his game even more. So although I know you want to see Dane in there, you want to see him do what he does. They're so efficient when Coleman's at the five because of the variety that they can have. So I think that's kind of what got him started. But when he communicates, when you see him barking, talking, that's when he's at his best because he's out of his own head. So that's kind of my theory on it. And, man, he was tremendous last night. I I mentioned if you stick around for the film, he contested a hell of a lot of shots. And it was a big reason why they won the game. Yeah, it was that that Ron Harper, Keegan Murray kind of performance, I I thought, last night defensively, uh, where I I don't think he's played at an all-Big Ten defensive level this season, Mike, and and I think he should. I I think that should be the expectation for him. I just brought this uh, his game log up here because you mentioned the turnovers. He gets a couple per game here recently, but Mm -hmm. we haven't seen that that five-turnover performance since the Missouri game, right? He had that, Alabama A&M. Um, Lindenwood, UCLA, Monmouth, all five plus turnover games. The last four was Bethune Cookman. Like this month, his biggest turnover game is Northwestern. For a guy who's directing traffic, passing it a lot, that, that's a huge improvement there. And look at the offensive rebounds. Yeah. I mean, I think he had five offensive rebounds against Eastern Illinois. Okay. He had four against Maryland, which also was a game that he played extremely well. Yeah. So that the activity, right? The motor, when he's being that utility guy. And then when he adds in the skill on top of it, that's really the icing on the cake. You got three out of his last four games, he's had three plus offensive rebounds, and two of those games have been four offensive rebounds. Mm-hmm. There's no surprise there. I mean, last night when he's relentless on the glass, it's not just getting the offensive rebound. They fouled him a couple times. Uh, there are a couple times he got fouled where it wasn't called. And I, I don't think there's any surprise here that when you look at really since the Wisconsin game, when they've started to really hone in on the spread and um, the predictability offensively, he hasn't had more than two turnovers in a game. And that helps them. That helps them tremendously. And um, look, I, it's never going to be perfect with him. It's never going to be perfect with anybody. Right. But he puts himself in a much better position to impact the game when he is using that motor. And then you mentioned the, the all-defense the all 
Big Ten all defense thing. In my opinion, at least, what ends up happening when you get selected for an all defense team or, you know, you're one of those top five guys, they always point back to performances. He held so and so to two for 13. He held so and so to, and you can't do that when you're switching one through five. Yeah. But you can now. So I think as he continues to build this, you can point back to Bryce Sensiball and what he did to Bryce Sensiball. You can point back to he guards Chris Murray or whoever. That's how you state your case. Because a lot of times people aren't going to go back through and be like, man, look at all the contesting he did against Ohio State. It's yeah. going to be who did he go up against, who did he stop, and why did it impact the game? So yeah. I think that's something for him too where he can continue. And I'll go back. I said this after Minnesota. They start doing the not switching thing, and you have actual matchups where you say, this is my guy. Like I can take pride in that. We're not just I don't have just a different guy every possession. That's a big deal, not only just for a Terrence Shannon, but for a Coleman Hawkins. Yeah, and he does seem like you've talked about the team during this. His offense and defense seem to coincide with one another. Uh, and Derek Piper had the stat yesterday. When his offensive rating is over 100, Illinois is 10 and 1. Yep, this yep. So no surprise there. I think this team goes as he goes, right? I, 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 I hate putting that pressure on him, but he just connects everything, both offensively and defensively. He, he's too involved in what they do to not have that type of yep. impact on winning. And, and you could probably say the same about Terrence Shannon uh, and, and, to a degree, Matthew Meyer as well. I mean, all of them, all three of those guys are probably their three most high-usage guys, so you're going to have to be good. And they, all three of them were good last night, and they look really hard to beat. So it's not going to be perfect. You're not going to have all three every night, but two, if you can get two out of three on most nights, you're going you're gonna to find yourself in this thing. We'll see what Purdue ends up doing, but you'll, you'll find yourself right there in the thick of it. I want to bring up Dane Danger. I know you had some thoughts on him. Obviously, two breakout performances against Michigan State and Minnesota. This week, not as good. Seven fouls. Um, you know, played 13 minutes against Ohio State. Thought he had some poor moments. Obviously, defensively against Indiana, as Trace kind of took him uh, to, to lunch there. And, I, I mean, Trace is playing at a ridiculous level right now. But just uh, what are your thoughts on Dane the last couple games? Yeah, I think it's he had his welcome to the league moment last game and and part of it too is when you go through all the teams that they've played up to that point i remember going into the game i was like they haven't played a true big the whole like literally the whole entire year even even bona from ucla that's not they're not going to force feed him so you go you go all in on the list minnesota no michigan state no nebraska no wisconsin no northwestern no missouri no penn state no maryland no none of them (laughs) Just Crowell's a stretch five, right? Like, yeah, and even Virginia, like, they have a good big, but they don't, they don't feature him. Trace Jackson Davis is featured, so now you learn and you say, okay, I got a lot of trust from the staff. They wanted to play it straight up and go one on one, and it didn't work. And it didn't work for a lot of reasons. One, he got caught laying behind a few times when he did try to three quarter and and try to front or fight over. Got his hand on the ball. He stripped track, Trace Jackson Davis a couple times. He stripped Bryce Sensiball last night. And this is the overarching thing I'll say with Dane. Well, There's really two things. He has got to understand that when you are guarding these bigs, Trace Jackson Davis, Hunter Dickinson, Edie's going to post you a little bit lower. He's not going to go out to 17 feet. But your strength is your length. Okay? I know you got – like, you're a big body. So are they. Wash. When you start getting out at 17 feet and you start chesting the guy, I've talked about him since your Harris before when he was guarding Jaden Pick, Pickett. When you're chesting the guy and you try to chest, 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 that's a steady diet. They're going to wait, and the second you're trying to absorb that blow, they go, and you're out of the play. That's why Trace Jacks Davis looked like he had fast break dunks in the half court because mm-hmm. he was getting around guys and dunking. I've mentioned this on this podcast before, and if you're watching on YouTube, this will be a lot more helpful than if you're listening to it on a podcast. But when I am guarding someone, this camera is is who I'm guarding, okay? In order to be able to cut a guy off, because that's all you want to do with a Trace Jackson Davis. He's going to catch it 17 feet. He's going to square you up. In order to cut a guy off, for me, it was different, right? Me, the length that I have right here all the way up was not very long. From my fingertips to my chest was not very long. So I, I was there on a contest, but it made it a lot harder to slide right? Because there's not as much space. If you give yourself space, you give yourself space to cut off those angles. 
Dane Danger, bro. You, I mean, you got a nine foot wingspan. So when you get into that, like you can play the chess game, but your strength is I am right here. Yeah. I can contest. You want to shoot a mid range jumper? Great. But the one thing I'm doing is giving myself all this space to when you make your first move, I slide, I cut it off. You may spin off me, we got help coming. But like doing the whole like, I'm going to try to body you at 15, 17 feet, that's impossible. It's definitely impossible on Trace Jackson Davis. So that's, that's probably a competitive thing, right? It, yeah. It, and like, like, smarter and like, it's like, hey, use your math advantage. <laughs> yeah. And look, like less is more. You may think, all right, yeah, I'm laying off of him a little bit. Maybe I'm giving him a little bit of runway, but you're also giving yourself a chance to slide and to cut it off. And like when you, when you push up that far, you got to be perfect. And it's really hard to be perfect against a guy like that. So that's the one, that's what I'll mention. And then the last thing with him, is this look he is a tremendous young player for where he's at right now in his career the fact he gets that much trust from this staff i think says a lot that hey we're gonna give you one-on-one with trace jackson freaking davis and you know he he clearly wanted to accept that challenge and you got blitzed okay so you learn from it now the one thing with dane and this is every young player in america the the good ones the great ones can be a little bit different the good ones and the ones where it's just kind of par for the course is your motor is dictated by results. You know, your motors dictate, all right, are you going to run the floor hard because you just scored? Well, how about when you just airball a left-handed hook shot like he did last game? Because mm-hmm. what ended up happening was he airballs the left-handed hook, doesn't sprint like he should. Now Zed Key beats him down the floor. So, so play this out too. Zed Key beats you down the floor. So what you're first worried about when a, when a big man beats you down the floor is getting sealed near the free throw line. Because if you get sealed, they can throw over the top for a layup. So what you do is you try to speed up and run behind them to lay behind. And then when you think, oh, I got to be three quarters, then you start to wrestle and fight back over. And it's a foul. And it's all because you didn't run. And it's all because your results vote, your results based. Ah, God, missed the floor. And I'm telling you, Every young player does it. It's the great ones that separate it. I'm not saying this is like an indictment on Dane. Everyone does it. But if you want to be great and you want to be consistent, you can't let any of that enter your mind. Because you could see in the second half, a couple dunks, layups, this man's stripping Bryce sense of all. He's getting – it looked different. So it's, it's, a, it's a young thing, man. It's like what young guys have hard. to learn. It's you, hard. I- it's going against human nature. Like I, I think we've all been there in whatever level of sports or competition we've had. Like it's hard to get out of your head, like right away. And just second nature is just like to run back down the court. And it's it'll lead me into this conversation, Mike. It's what I'm loving about Ty Rogers. Ooh. Right? That, that guy, that guy can airball a three or, or just brick something, miss a layup, and he's busting at his ass no matter what. Like, um, we're starting, we're starting to see the Ty Rogers. That we thought, and and boy, I think it's huge for their defense because he's he's such a good rebounder, Mike. Like to, to get another rebounder like that, defender like that, and then the offensive glass as well. It's just there's so much activity, uh, and it's like sincere Harris has provided that, but you're getting it at a bigger body now in Ty Rogers. Look, he's a he's a freshman. He may be their best on the ball defender, and yeah. that's saying a lot because they have a few good ones. But he the way he levels guys off. And does it without fouling for the most part. He got some he got some BS ones last night, but you've seen it game after game. And good players too. I mean, the Bryce Sensible foul last night in the first half. I didn't think that should have been one. I thought he he might have flopped, but geez, he's making life really hard. And he and he may be their best rebounder too. That's uh, and and that's that's <laughs> on ball defense and rebounding. You're usually talking about old guys. Yeah, I'm talking about a freshman. Because right now, like, that's what – I mean, Bryce Sensabaugh is a tremendous player. That's what he struggles with. He gets picked on defensively. Not because he's not good at it. He just he just doesn't have that want to. Ty has that want to. And to your point, it does not change. He could smoke a layup like he did, wide open, sprint his ass back, doesn't matter. Get right back into it, right? Get back in the mud. That's what he does. And to have a guy like that, I think the trust is continuing to build. And I'm saying, like, there's going to be a game, I'm telling you, there's going to be a game under a minute left where you're like, Ty Rogers is out there. 
It's going to happen. I don't know what game it's going to be, but it's going to happen at some point. And it's because that trust is building. And not only just trust from the staff to him, trust, but trusting himself. Yeah. I think that's another step, too. I thought he was a little bit frantic and sped up in the beginning of the season. And now he's much more under control. He's finding different ways to utilize his skills. I mean, hit the cut that he made to even get that wide open layup, I'll show it on the film, was just, I'm a basketball player. I mean, that was not a design play. They threw a pick and pop back to Coleman Hawkins. Ty Rogers' guy was the guy that had to, to stunt or at least rotate over. And the second he left to go stunt, Ty dove to the rim. Instead of standing there for the one more where he's not really going to be guarded out there. And he's also not going to be prioritized on a rotation because like, oh, non-shooter, we're not going to rotate over to him. He cuts. That's where he's a threat. He's going to get that again. He's going to lay it in or he's going to dunk it. But, man, it's the, it's the reason why, as a coach, you're like, we got to find more minutes for him. Yeah. And that puts more pressure on an R.J. Melendez. And there, I don't think there's any coincidence where the emergence of Ty Rogers, like, oh, R.J.'s freaking garden. R.J.'s playing his ass off. Tweeting that's out what, defense wins. <laughs> that's what makes good teams, man. Like, you get your eighth, ninth guy playing like that, then your sixth, seventh guy's like – Man, I gotta, I gotta go. Like this guy's coming for me. I'm not gonna let that happen. And Luke Goody's gonna come back. It's gonna add it even more. Yep. So that's why. Okay, it's great having two, three good players. Great, but when you have five, six good players, and you have eight or nine that really want to make an impact, raises the level of everybody's play. And Ty's a big reason for that. Mike, I think everything's kind of settling in rotation wise with this team, which is why it'll be interesting when Luke Goody comes back. Um, but Jade Knapp's inserted into the starting lineup. What is the impact of that? Like we, we debate, does it matter who starts? Does it not matter who starts? Clearly, Brad Underwood thought, okay, he's our lead guard. Time to put him in the starting lineup. It was time. It was time. I think when Sincere got put into the starting lineup, I, I think it made sense. I think. Mm-hmm. Getting off to a good start, defending. Jay Neff's been guarding, man. He's been guarding. So now, Sincere's impact defensively, which is still great. Now that Jaden has kind of upped that level a little bit, now you can really rationalize, man. Not only can we get off to a good start defensively, because Jaden, there's going to be no letdown there, but he's a better offensive player. And we can run more things through him. You saw he was very involved in the chin action that they were running, that kind of three-man game in the middle of the floor where he can cut off of it. He's a threat, enough of a threat as a shooter where guys have to fight over the top, and that opens up slips for guys like Coleman, guys like Coleman Hawkins, Matthew Meyer. You can do a lot with Jaden. And Sincere, I think, is probably getting back to where he can have an impact where it's, hey, in spurts, bring that energy – he, he was tremendous on the glass last night. He had a couple big rebounds, uh, and that's what you need from him. Okay, but Jaden at this point has earned, like, bro, non to go. Like, you're playing 25 plus minutes. Right. He's that good of a scorer. He, he just dogged Sean McNeil, fighting through screens. He was good on Bruce Thornton. And he's, and Bruce Thornton, I think, was a five star. I think Jaden Epps is a better player. Def- definitely a. Top 60 guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, Bruce Thornton was up there, four or five, star, whatever he was. But Jaden Epps is the better player. There's no question. Mm-hmm. And he's, he's playing like one of the better freshmen in this league, in a league that has some damn good freshmen. Like, I think he's he, he, sh- he should be right there. I mean, I don't know off the top of my head. I know Jet Howard and Bryce Sensabaugh. Like, there's there's a lot of good freshmen in this league. But, man, by the end of the season, he, he should be right there in the mix for, for that all-freshman team. Yeah, and the rest of his teammates deserve credit for stifling sense of ball, but Jade Nepps yep. matched his scoring production. Right? Yep. That's that's a huge win uh, for Illinois. All right, Mike, uh, another big road game. Illinois has a couple home games, but uh, now they head back on the road in a place they've won back-to-back games, amazingly. Uh, after a 15-game losing streak, Illinois has now won five straight against Wisconsin, including two up at Cole Center. Obviously, Illinois got the best of Wisconsin here at State Farm Center. Uh, Tyler Wall was not in that game. I do think Illinois has more length to combat a, a Tyler Wall this year, but what do you think about that matchup? Well, that, it's always tough. They just – you, you got to go into that game and execution has to be at the forefront of your mind because like we talked about before, the first Wisconsin game, they won't beat themselves. They won't. Now, I, now I don't think they're incredibly talented. I think, I think Max Klesman's out too, so – I don't know if he's still out. I know he was out there their previous game. 
but that hurts them a lot because now you're relying on some guys that I think you wouldn't want to rely on as heavily. But uh, again, they dominated them, dominated them in the paint in that first game. And you got another opportunity to do that. Uh, Cole Center is always weird. We never won there when I was there at it's Illinois. Cold, right? It's cold. It's cold. It's just, it's, it's a weird vibe, man. It's, it's, I, it's, it's not like the rack. The rack's really a really tough place to play, but it's, it's up there. I think it's right up there with, and it's not like it's crazy loud or the fans are nuts. It's just, I don't know. It's always weird. Like it's probably gonna be like eight inches of snow up there on Saturday. And it, I don't know what, what time's the game at two. Oh, it's always like a matinee. It's like a 11 AM noon two. but look, you, you want to go win on the road, go back to what we talked about earlier in the show guard. That's it. Cause you know, you're going to get what you want offensively. And they, they're starting – I think they're starting to utilize that chin action a lot. Um, they're utilizing a lot of spread. I think Dane can have a good game in this game. But also, I think that 20-minute a game mark is going to be right where he's at because I think you, you can do a lot with Coleman at the five. And that's a good problem to have. Where you can – if Dane's got it going, great. If not, then shoot, we're difficult to guard and, and, and we're difficult to score on when, when we got Coleman in there. So – it should be a good one. And, and look, you're sitting at five and four right now, a chance to get to six and four, get a half game back of, of Rutgers. I'm not sure when, when Rutgers' next game is, but uh, – and you distance yourself, right? These are the games now when it's – when the middle is cannibalizing itself like it is in this league, pretty much every game you, you play is a chance to distance yourself from somebody. And they have a chance to do that. Northwestern's still up there at four and three. Water is going to find its level with those guys. I'm telling you, their February is treacherous. Yeah. So I'm not worried about them. Michigan, they're five and three, haven't had a very tough schedule whatsoever. They're going to start playing some tough games. you got a shot, man. Uh, and it may not be a shot to win the league because Purdue's been that good, but you got a shot to, to solidify yourself as a, as a Friday team yeah. and get the double bye. And I think that's, that's what you should be gunning for here. You should obviously be gunning for the league. Right. And you hope it comes down to March 5th or whenever that is against Purdue. Um, but man, they'd have to start losing some games. Yeah, my my expectation for Illinois would be get a top four finish in the Big Ten for a fourth straight year. I think that'd be a phenomenal um, season for them. To be honest with you, you're a top six seed, five seed if you're a top four team uh, in in the Big Ten. I'm talking about the NCAA tournament seeding. Um, and, and I think if you look at these teams like Purdue, Rutgers, and then I think Illinois should be right there, like the third or fourth team in the league. Like I don't buy Northwestern. I really get frustrated watching Michigan. They got two stars and, and not much else. Michigan State, I think, is tough. Uh, tough out. I think Indiana is coming on. I think they could be a team that could be a top four team. Iowa, I want to believe in, but it's hard to with, with their defense. Wisconsin, I don't buy. Penn State's limited. Maryland's talented. They're top five. Like, Illinois should be a top four team. I think that should be their goal, right? Like, obviously, they are shooting higher, but if from the outside, if Illinois is a top four team, I think they had a good season. Agreed. And look, this is life in the Big Ten. It's you try to map it out and look at schedules. I mean, I'll say this right now: I wouldn't be surprised to see Ohio State beat Indiana. And then I, I would not be surprised to see that. So it's, it's like just when you feel like you got your footing in this league, you don't. So Indiana for Illinois happens, right? Like exactly. So that's that's one game that I have circled because I think that's as much as Indiana is coming on. It's we'll see. They've won three straight. And I, it's it's funny looking through this. You got Wisconsin, Iowa, Penn State, Maryland, Ohio State, Nebraska. One game losing streaks. Minnesota's lost three straight. And then you got Illinois, Northwestern, Michigan, Rutgers. One game winning streaks. <laughs> Michigan's lost one straight. And then at the top you got Purdue's won six straight. And in the middle you got Indiana. It's won three straight. So I think that's pretty much a microcosm of what this league has been where it's like, you win one, you lose one, you win one, you lose one. And somebody has to find their footing, like really find their footing here. And it very well could be Illinois where yeah. you find your footing and you start really distancing yourself from the middle. Cause I don't know. I, I don't want to, I don't want to hang around the middle too much. Yeah. Cause if you're hanging around the middle, that means you're winning and you're losing and you, you haven't found any consistency. So if you can, if they can find themselves and be like, Hey, you know, we can end this thing. 13 and seven, right? I think that's doable. Now, I think Purdue, what, they're eight and one right now? I don't I know if they, they dip below I mean, 15. 
I, 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 more than 16 games. I, yeah, there. I don't think they're going any anywhere below 15 unless Zach Eady, something happens to him, God forbid. Um, Smith, yeah, Braden Smith. Or Braden Smith, I mean, they're, they're going to be in a good spot. So we'll see what happens. But it's funny listening to analysts and people break it down where they're always like, this league has as many good teams as anybody, except for the Big 12. It's like everyone says that. It's like you keep forgetting Big 12 has 10 teams. So it's you know that you you have a chance to have more of the conference be good. But uh, I mean, I you go down the list. I mean, the Big Ten has 12 good teams. Yeah. And even Nebraska, this isn't your older brothers in Nebraska, where it's like, ah, we got Nebraska tonight. They can get you. So and even like Minnesota is the worst team in the league, and they got guys like Dawson okay. Garcia and Jamison Bat. Like they got good players. So um, it reminds me of earlier. I mean, 2012, 2013. I think Penn State. Uh, they were 0 and 14 before they knocked off Michigan, who I think was like the second ranked team in the country at that point with Trey Burke. And that Penn State team, who was last with no wins in the conference, had like two NBA players. So they had Tim Frazier, and I think DJ Newbill might have had a cup of coffee in the league too. It's just. It's funny how this league works, man. Year in and year out, it's like, is it a down league? Or is there just not like a ton of NBA draft picks? Yeah. Michael Tewitt, man. Uh, always great catching up with you. We'll catch up with you next week. Appreciate it, man.